Want to introduce us, Fritz? Since then you can explain why we're late. I've already explained why we're late. We're late because of Jake. <laughs> and now they can finally see that uh, apparatus you're using. I feel an appreciation for what I do. Did you got video? Yeah, that's more We ready? I think so. Just give me one second. Back. I don't have okay, I do oh, now. I do. All right, I think we are ready. Go ahead. We're live? Yeah. Hi, folks. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. We were trying to incorporate two cameras. We didn't, weren't able to, right? Uh, it's working so far. No, uh, so now we had to. Welcome to our uh, Saturday Night Live YouTube workshop in support of our Purple Heart program, where you get to answer the questions, and we hopefully will provide you with an answer. So, quick, quick uh, rundown of the format. We'll answer a lot of questions. We give away a lot of prizes. You can make donations if you like, if you feel so inclined. And we've got always have a little bit of news for you. I'll, I'll mention it when we have a few more people on so that uh, as many people as possible will be able to hear it at the same time. Tonight we have Jake behind the camera. We have Frick behind the audio visual. We have Megan. Megan is there so that anybody, any combat wounded vet that has been in our class as one of our guests, if you would kindly shout out to Megan. You just, what you do is you do um, at Megan. Yeah. If that makes sense to you. At Megan and then your name and the class you were in and then she'll tell us and we can, we can uh, acknowledge your presence. We have Moose here. Moose, in support of our new Dead Cat Purple Hearts that I'm wearing. And until the heaters cook me, I'll keep it on as long as possible. Beside him is Ken. Everybody where's your Where's your microphone? It has to be on the outside. Right here. It has to be on the outside. We're getting too much dead cat fur <laughs> sound. Really? I'll clip it the other way. Yeah. That ain't better? Yes. Ken's here. Ken works with us. In fact, Ken, is, uh, Ken manages this side of the shop. Jake manages that side of the shop, and I do as little as possible. And we have Harold with us tonight, and Harold is the star of our, of our shooting boards, and uh, he pretty much works full-time just building shooting boards. So I'll tell you real quick, and then I'll repeat it. So tonight's prizes, we are giving away uh, shooting boards, Three different sizes. Actually, we're going to do four. Well, if we have, if we will, we'll give away four. We have our mini. That's for use with a shoot with a um, block plane. We have our 18 inch, 90 degree, or 24 inch, 90 degree. And if we have enough donations, we'll give away some of the new mitered shooting boards. You can tell us whether you want left or right. Our our grand prize tonight will be my Purple Heart medium tenon. Wait, what's it? What's a grand prize of four thousand? No, no, two. We reached two thousand, and we'll give away, and we'll give that away. Somebody, somebody will get it. And um, uh, well, I'll tell you several times tonight. But we have our new dead cats. Friend of Moose did all of the uh, artwork um, as a donation to the program. So we're going to give away. Uh, we're going to give away three dead cat sweaters tonight as well. And you can tell us the size that you want. If you don't get lucky and you want to buy one yourself, patsecretgarden.com. It's right on there. Don't go looking for dead cat. Look for cozy fleece. Quarter inch cozy fleece. Quarter, uh, quarter zip. Quarter cozy zip cozy, cozy fleece. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm working with him about the name. It's his picture, so you can't miss it. Oh, there you go. There you go. Even you though want you want it. to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be worth a little extra. Yeah. If you can get by that, you're good. And uh, we'll say some special, uh, we'll get some special news and some uh, sad news as well. But unfortunately, that is life. So, quick, for question number one. Uh, okay. Question number one comes from Dave Matkey in Virginia. Hi, Dave. He says, what's your favorite food? And do you ever <laughs> sharpen your kitchen knives with your Shapton stones? Are you kidding? This is what, this is what they're going to be like. They're okay. Be no, no, I meant sharpening them with the kitchen knives. Um, Favorite food? 
Well, why am I looking around? What, what, what is my favorite I, food? To me. I don't know. Well, uh, so I'm going to give you this straight goods, Dave. Here's the problem. I, uh, I eliminated, I got rid of red meat way back in the early 90s. I got rid of sugar back in 2008. I got rid of gluten and dairy three years ago. And his life gave up meaning. And uh, that doesn't leave a whole lot. Eats curd. But my daughter, Erica, who is Frick's wife, best thing ever happened to him, is uh, she's also adopted a lot of this. So she doesn't, um, she doesn't feed her children a lot of what I don't eat. So she goes on and she finds these recipes that are just incredible. So With expensive ingredients. Yes, but then they're cheap because they don't cost anything. Because Frick pays for it. But she makes a cheesecake out of cashews that soak all night. And it is, it is incredible. But I, I don't have any one particular food. Uh, I do like potatoes. And sharpening knives. Uh, no, I don't. I, you know what? I, I have. If you, if, I'll tell you, if you, want to sh if you want something to sharpen your kitchen knives with, just get a Trend diamond plate. It's, it's pretty much indestructible. Yeah. Like that. And it'll, gi it'll give you uh, an edge more than sufficient for your kitchen needs. But I, I have sharpened it. But you know what? I have a bunch of children, and the knives all get thrown in a drawer, even though there's a knife block, but it doesn't get used after a while. So it's, um, it's not worth putting the effort in to see them. What grit diamond plate? Well, that one has a 600 grit side and a 1,000. Pardon me, a 300 grit side and a 1,000 grit side, and it's such a it's such a durable. I mean, you can't you pretty much can't destroy it unless you let it rust. So it's it's great. In fact, actually, Jake, where, are we going to carry these? I just saw that you put them here the other day. Where where are they? The uh, cards. Uh, just a second. Let me let me dig this out and show you what I'm talking about. Because this would actually, uh, no, no, I just saw it today when I was cleaning up. Can't you tell? So I, I must uh, give a shout out to Tony Bahadur. Bahadur, if he's on tonight. Tony is a combat wounded vet, Canadian Army, 27 years. Medically retired just a month ago. I don't, I don't even think it was a complete month ago. I think his MOS was organizing the thing. Oh, <laughs> Tony's amazing. I mean, he just comes in here and it's like a hurricane. And the amount that he, the amount of work that he can do. Wait, no, you're in a hurricane. Yeah, he cleans up. Clean. Yeah, yeah, clean disaster clean. relief. He's just, uh, he's actually, it's a, we're, he's, yeah, he's great, great worker. And I also have to mention Al, Al Mc, Mc, McNeil. McNeil. Al started working here about uh, how long ago, Ken? A month. Has it only been a month? Well, maybe two. How long has Harold been here? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Ken only works one or two days a week. <laughs> Al is a combat wounded vet as well. Al was uh, retired as a tank <coughs> commander, had quite an, a, uh, an event with a suicide bomber and a Toyota truck full of propane tanks, put a bit of a damper on things, but Al just started working here too, so great having these guys, and uh, it's just awesome being around them. Anyway, so here's what you want. Are we, are we going to carry these? Yeah. Okay, so these are called, called credit card. credit card, really, that's what they call it, credit card zones? So look at this. Uh, I would guess and say that's about a sixteenth of an inch thick. So that's a 1,000 on one side, a 600 on the opposite side, and this one I think is a 300 and a... 180. Is it? Or 3 and a 6, maybe. So this is the same, same company, same product. This is a 180 and a 300. So you would, that would call, be called extra coarse and coarse, and this would be fine. called fine and extra fine. But it's just, uh, we, use them, we use them on the side of our skates for taking off a burr. But kitchen knives or anything, and it just lasts a long time. Just a little bit of oil to lubricate it, and they work great. I'll demonstrate it actually later. Good question. At least the sharpening part. Next one, Frick. That's my brother Mike. Just drifted in. Mike drives, uh, drives for what company? Paradise. Paradise. 
So he uh, he's he lives in Western Canada. Occasionally, he makes it here. <laughs> next question, Frank. All right. Next question comes from uh, Dan Rockney in Denver. Hi, Dan in Denver. I've been to Denver numerous times. He says dovetails, tails or pins first. Benefits, drawbacks of each approach. Oh, you know what? We did. A, I did a YouTube video on that. Uh, what was the name of it? Do you remember? Can you about dev tails first? Yeah. <coughs> said tails or pins first. Tails Benefit. or pins first. Tails, tails versus pins. I think it was. Tails first. Are you talking about the one that you did? We no, we did a video pins versus tails. I think if you go onto my channel and look up pins versus tails. But I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you quickly. So, in case you're new and you're not quite uh, catching what he's talking about, this, by the way, is a current project in the online workshop. This, this is a. This is part of the chop saw stand. Chop saw is going to sit there, and then there'll be a table on either side, and in there will be a wheeled. If you look over there, find it very convenient. A, a wheeled box holding all of the uh, offcuts for whoever comes to get them. So, tails are this part. So, if you look at a drawer, you're always going to find your tails on the front and on the back. Pins are going to be on what would be called the drawer front and the drawer back. So, there are those who are uh, misled in life and they cut pins first, which is backwards. I don't know why anybody would do that. I have a, uh, I have a sample right here. Okay, so if you do pins first, here's what you have to do. You've got to balance this on there like that. Now, here's where it becomes a problem that you, it, people don't always think about. If you're doing, uh, just a second, I'm reaching for a sharp pen. Next time one of the kids don't, don't have anything to do, Ken, would you put them to work? Sharpening, pencils. Sharpening those pencils. I'll get Harold to uh, need you now. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Qualified? If you do tails first, and you, you're doing a typical drawer, for, this is a good example, but I've got an even better one right here. Drawers are usually, at least I like to do them this way, um, thick drawer fronts and relatively thin drawer sides. I was gonna clean this up before tonight, but that didn't happen. So, one of the big advantages of a dovetail in a drawer is the fact that it so strengthens the corner. In fact, it provides so much strength that you can really reduce the thickness of your drawer side, which lightens your drawer and makes it easier to operate. I think it makes it look a lot better. It elevates it as opposed to a big thick drawer side. So I like to have the front to be fairly thick because it draws out the tail and the pin and I think it looks a lot better than opposed to stubby ones. So you can imagine if this had been a drawer front, the, these probably would have only been about that long, these pins. So you'd be way down here trying to reach up in there and trying to mark these. I think it's very difficult. I also think it's difficult. Now I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Let's just copy this. Do you usually do it with a knife? Or well, they usually do it with a pencil, which is another area of concern because I don't think that's near as accurate. So I didn't uh, put my baseline on there, but let's put one. So now you have these lines, and you've got to come in with your saw, and imagine if you're new at this. You're not even sure which side of the dovetail saw to use yet. I'm getting warm. And now you've got, and you'll come in, let's be fair to this method. You're going to square your lines off of those marks. This is a good question. I don't get to beat up on this very often. Let me come way over here. Okay, so the question becomes, is it more, is it easier to follow an angled line or a plumb line? Um, I'm going to suggest that it's easier to follow a plumb line. Now, why am I saying that? Well, if you did this part first and your angles are off, it doesn't matter. 
because this is the template. What you now have to do is you have to make a second piece that will fit the template. So if in the process of doing this, this angle ends up being nine degrees, and this one is seven, and this one is 12, and this one is six, I mean, look a little wonky, but it's not really going to matter as long as these parts are correct. So you go ahead and you mark these. This allows you to mark with a knife. Actually, I've even got a better way now. But either way, here, here, is, the, uh, here is the final decision and the dilemma. So I've got two pieces sitting in front of me. I'm new at this. I've got to either try to make these cuts on these angles and get them accurate. You can't be wrong. Or can I make plumb cuts, which is going to be easier? Well, if you have a heavy saw, and if your saw has what we call a pistol grip, the advantage of a pistol grip is every time I pick it up, it goes in the same spot. I could close my eyes, and I still know where the blade is based on the handle. You don't get that with a round handle saw, so you always want a pistol grip. Now, if it's a heavy saw, gravity plays a big role because gravity tells, brings you perpendicular to the earth. So as long as you have your board standing plumb, and if you watch me cut dovetails, you'll notice that I always do that. Now all I have to do is essentially let the saw do its thing, which is fall perpendicular to the earth, get my saw cut started, and you'll find, and I can say this with some uh, surety because I've taught enough people to do it, but it doesn't take very long for these guys to get plumb cuts just by feel alone, believe it or not. So the primary reason, now this is just... If you live in a uh, climate where this, where it's hot, uh, cold, you have to get one of these. Huh? That's uh, X L or L. I don't know. Let me say on the tag. Game worn too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll sign it for you. Okay. <laughs> so, for the simple, I think that's the that's probably the single biggest reason is that it's much more natural to make plumb cuts than it is to make angled cuts. You'll get better at it doing the angle, doing the uh, tails first versus the pins first. And if you want me to take that a step further, my new technique using the, uh, using the um, dovetail marking knife and our soon to be released Sean Shim. I hope he's on tonight. And if you're not familiar with this, this allows you to offset your two pieces, so after you've cut your tails, instead of removing the waste, you simply use that tailboard as your template. So you've made saw cuts in here. Actually, instead of just talking about it, let me just crank it out real quick and I'll show you. So, tails first. We come in here, very, very important that those cuts across the end of the board be plumb, are perpendicular to the face. Now, before you remove any of the waste, you would then set your pin board in there. You'd set this on top. Now you have to account for the thickness of the saw blade. So with our little Sean Shim, you would simply move, by the way, in case you didn't see that, it has an offset of 23 thousandths of an inch. So you would move it over, which is going to be what your saw kerf is, and that's 23 thou in case you're wondering because that saw has been sharpened a few times. And you would take a knife like this, which has the same, this is gonna be a bit infomercial. This little blade is the exact same as that blade. So when you put it down in there, what you're gonna notice is there's no wiggle room. So when I drag that through, it can't slide left or right. What it's going to do is going to leave a mark on the second piece that is exactly the saw curve. So then I would go to the next one same thing, and then I would go to the next one. Now I have to do the other side. So what I would do this time is I would turn this around. Now the offset's on the top, set it like that, move it over. I've just moved this piece, the thickness of one saw kerf, and I go to the opposite side of the tail, and I drag it through. Now when you remove this, Instead of guessing or wondering where you need to put your saw, you just wait till your saw drops into that kerf and you finish your cut.
And that is the most precise way to cut dovetails. This method allows, on average, eight out of every 12 students in a one-day class to do a dovetail that would look like either of those first try. Hard to believe? I know. You have to be there to witness it, but trust me, it works. So that trumps all other reasons as to why you should do tails first versus pins first from now on. Great question. Thank you. Next, Rick. What's your favorite episode of MASH? Oh, my favorite episode of MASH. I have favorite quotes. Uh, absolute favorite episode of MASH. Oh, you know. Absolute favorite episode of MASH. Uh, it could be when Margaret told Frank, I was a huge Frank fan, you had to be a really good actor to make everybody hate you. <laughs> when when, when uh, Margaret came back from Tokyo, engaged to uh, Donald Penobscot, Huey, Dewey, and Louie Penobscot, and she told Frank in the mess, <laughs> Frank, is there a bee on me? <laughs> she was trying to show him the little tiny ring. You know, our over hill over dale our love will ever fail that's another episode anyway and then uh, frank takes it very calmly and as he's going out the out, out the mash the mess hall he slams the door and the door falls off the hinges and that was a great episode that was probably that was probably one of my best but my best frank Mer barnes quote was hawkeye and uh, trapper were giving him a hard time or was it bj i think we're giving him a hard time because he was really leaning on some poor wounded soldier and uh him wanting everyone to comply, and Frank said, or Hawkeye said, well, Frank, what about individuality? And Frank responded, well, individuality's fine, as long as we all do it together. <laughs> Favorite quote. Good next question. one, Frank. Uh, next question comes from Jason Brown. In Hi, the, Jason. In the chat, he says, which project surprised or taught you the most, either which? in the online workshop or over your career? Which project surprised or taught you the most? Oh, Oh, you guys are making me think. <coughs> Which project? Uh, or taught me the most? Well, it, here's what happens. You get into it. It's all consuming. You finish it. You're on to the next one. And that stuff tends to fade away. In fact, I have to stop and think about it to try to come up with, I uh, even remember having done it. And unfortunately, this is a real sad story. I was always, in, I, I tried to earn a living with, uh, I think we had five children or six children, I can't remember which, before I finally found a way to make a living. And it wasn't building furniture, it was selling tools. But for the 11 years that I did it, it was just a starvation game. I remember being down to $75. We had five children and I had $75 to my name. Lots of work, no money. And uh, it wasn't being spent foolishly because I was in the shop 24 hours a day. I wasn't, I wasn't even playing hockey. I, I couldn't afford. I couldn't afford the time to play hockey. That was to the 90s. That was painful memories. And um, where, where did I go with this? Oh, oh! What I was going to say is, so I built so much furniture. I don't even have a photograph of it. No record of it whatsoever. It was in such a sheer panic to get it finished, get it, get it to the customer, get paid, so I could pay off. I could take a deposit on the next job to pay off the bills from that one. What a nightmare! <laughs> Harold knows a little bit about this. Uh, we'll tell you a fun, funny one. So I had a. Um, I used to teach classes to try to drum up some money, and I I got into a little group of doctors who liked to do woodwork. So one doc knows another doc, and every, on Saturday mornings, once a month, my wife would do up a nice fruit tray with fresh rolls from my father's bake shop, and I would bring them up for either a dovetail class or a hand plane sharpening or something. And there would be six or seven of them there. And uh, I met one who happened to be in charge of all the anesthetists in the city. And they had one of their guys that was retiring, and they wanted, to, they wanted me to design and build a desk for him. So... I actually found that model. Is that, is that, I wonder if that's the model of it. Somewhere in here, there's a model no, it's, of it. It's over in the, it's over in the Oh, okay, never mind. 
Anyway, so I designed it for him. Is it made out of white oak? It had leather in a leather insert, a black leather insert, writing desk, and uh, yeah, it was beautiful. Lots of dovetails, very traditional looking, but white oak with some white oak burl that I got from England. Actually, it was English brown oak burl that was in the panels, and uh, yeah, in typical fashion. I remember about a month out, so they were going to be giving this. They had rented this really fancy place called uh, Shadow Lawn, where they were doing the presentation. So the idea was. They were coming there for this meal, then there would be the speeches, and then they would present the, the desk. So they said specifically, Rob, we need to have it on this date. You know, early December was probably the first deadline it was given. So as I got a couple months out, I said I called Ian up, and I said, Ian, when exactly do you need this? And he said, well, the presentation is on the evening of the 4th of December. Okay, fine. And as it got a little bit closer, I said, called him up one day, and I said, Ian, exactly what time on the 4th do you expect to present this? And he told me, well, the event starts at 7 o'clock. A few days out, I called him up and said, Ian, I know it starts at 7, but what time will you actually do the presentation? <laughs> well, he, Ian's starting to get a little bit nervous. He goes, probably right around quarter to 8. Oh. So at about 7 o'clock, I was sitting there with a hair dryer trying to blow the finish dry enough so we could touch it, and uh, loaded it up. We set it down outside where they were, the meeting was. We set it down as I heard them announcing that they were now going to present the gift. I literally, we were setting it down and sneaking out the door. And I think I, poor Ian aged a few years that night. Story of my life. And some other interesting ones, but... What did I, what piece of furniture did I learn the most on? <laughs> Probably that one, timing. Timing is everything. Next, Fred. All right, next one comes from Dr. Grimspoon1. What's his username? Hi, Hi. Dr. Grimspoon1. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Please, please, can you explain how you do a hidden pin in a mortise and tenon? Do you offset the hole slightly like a drawbore pin? Oh, his name's Guy, sorry, in England. Hey, guy. Um, Ask that again, please. Can you please explain how you do a hidden pin in a mortise and tenon? Do you offset the hole slightly like a draw bore pin? A hidden pin. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only thing I can think you're I can think that you're talking about is something like this, which we just happen to have. We just recently shot a video on doing a breadboard end. So did I glue this? I didn't glue this on, did I? So here we have a, uh, a big piece of pine. It's, uh, do you remember how long it was, how wide it was, Jake? 19. 19 and 8 inches long. And the old style was to put a band on the end to hide the end grain. Why they didn't want to see the end grain, I'm not sure. But, let's see if I can pull this out with a pair of pliers. As soon as I can take this apart, I can show you. Yep, yep, yep. I'm gonna try to pull this apart so I can show you. You hold that on there. Clever lad. Can you pull it out? Yeah? Okay. Good. Perfect. Never mind, never mind, Ken. I got it. Yeah, we managed to... Jake came up with an idea. Obviously, he's paying attention. So, this is the bottom. This is the top. So, you don't necessarily want to see a pin in there. So if I pull this apart, so this is the tenon, big long piece, and this fits into this slot. Now if you'll look, the slot is longer than the tenon is wide. And when you put it together, this pin in the middle makes it so that as this top expands, it sp expands the same amount out each side. 
And as it shrinks, it shrinks the same amount from the center so that it's always uniform, not all at one side or all out the other. Now, just so I explain what we did there, we purposely put a bit of a crown, uh, not a crown, but a, uh, what's the opposite of crown, Harold? What's the opposite of a crown? Hollow. Hollow? Hollow? Yeah. So instead of this being straight, it goes like this. The crown would be up there. So that when we put this together, we have to put a clamp in the middle. We put that clamp in the middle, and then we drilled this hole, but we didn't drill it all the way through. And what I would have done if I was doing this permanent, I would have glued about that much of it, put the pin in, pin would help hold it, and flush the pin off. You wouldn't see the pin on the top side, you'd only see it on the bottom side, but its purpose would be to help hold that in place and keep everything moving equal distance from center. Now, I can't imagine, I, I haven't, I'm not quite figuring out um, what his question was beyond that, so if, some, if he can restate it, I'll try. Next. Uh, okay, next one comes from Tony Petrillo. Hi, Tony. He says, we talk a lot about wood movement between woods across grain. How is it that we don't have issues with gluing mortise and tenon, which are cross grain and glued? Well, actually we do. So I, I, made, a, uh, I made a four poster bed for my wife and the headboard was quite large. And uh, if that had been a big long tenon, just like this, if that had fit, it fitted, is that a word? No, if it had fit. Fitted? If it had fit. It fit? If it had fit. If I had put this together in this application and that slot or that mortise was the exact same length as this is wide, when that expanded, it would <laughs> blow out those ends. So, and I wouldn't glue something like that. I wouldn't, that's why we, that's why we use this method. But you're right. And I'm, but I'm aware of it. When If I build something, I don't want the uh, mortise and tenon to be much to to be much more than three or four inches. And if it is, I'll always make sure that I leave a little bit of room in there. If you're using yellow glue or white, one's referred to as aliphatic resin, the other is polyvinyl acetate, they give, they'll creep a little bit. Uh, you can't expect a whole lot, but they will creep just a little bit. So you kind of have to be aware when you're doing that. Actually, what I was going to tell you is I built a, uh, I built... A uh, four-poster bed. This wasn't for my wife. This was for somebody else, another, another doctor. And the way, and it was actually there was a there was a tenon up here, and there was a tenon down here, and there was kind of a, a a hollow like this where part of the headboard met before the leg started to taper, and then the top part of the headboard connected up into the taper. Well, that means you had this big solid panel, this headboard that was going to shrink and expand going into this leg that wasn't going to, was very stable, dimensionally stable. So you knew there was going to be a lot of movement. So I did the same thing kind of as I did here. I made those small pieces that connected into the taper a little bit longer. So when I glued the whole thing up and I pulled the base, which would be the larger tenon, into the square part of the leg, that actually put these two pieces that were at the end of those hollows in tension. So they weren't glued, and they were sitting in a, in a an elongated mortise, so that tenon could move up and down a little bit, but because of the tension created, because of that them being a little bit longer, it stayed, it didn't pull apart. But am I look, I'm looking up there now? Yeah. Okay, you guys gotta keep me informed. Um, by if, the way, if you're standing before, in front of the bench like that, just yeah. talk to this one. Okay. So, just, Megan, anybody to say hello to? Uh, yeah, we have a couple of vets. Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, Who do we have? Kevin Burris. Who, Kev? Kev, brother? Gary Burnett. Gary? Joe Bright. Oh, home week. Hey, Joe Bright. <laughs> Joe, how are your phone call, brother? Um, Philip Lawrence. Hey, Phil. And Paul Morrison. Paul? Lieutenant Commander Paul? From Ottawa. Has he got his own boat yet? Do you have your own boat? Tell me if you have your own boat. Ship. Ship, sorry. <laughs> and it looks like Patrick Looking Tackett for a ride. just got on. Look too. for who? Patrick Tackett, isn't he? Patty Tack is on? Yeah. 
Patty Tack. Jake says hello. Actually, he sends you a hug. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Fred. Are we we're up here now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you're just standing there, if you're demonstrating something, we'll get in. But uh, okay, uh, this one's from Lester Smith. Hi, Lester. In Georgia. He says, what, what is the advantage or disadvantage of doing side-hung center-guided drawers like Gustav Stickley over the way you teach drawer fitting? Uh, I'm right. He's wrong. <laughs> Just That's kidding. There's, uh, there's lots of ways to do it. I prefer, the, uh, I prefer the old English way of doing it, which was Al Alan Peters taught. But I, we did a side-hung on Angie's high Ange. On Angie's bed desk at 10, if you don't bug me a little more, I'm never going to think about that finish. So you got to be on to me so we can get that done. Side hung are okay in certain applications. In that case, we had to. But when you can actually build like this, we ju I just in the process of finishing this, when you can actually build... We're not there. Oh, sorry. Are you going to come over here? Patty Tack says he loves you too, Jake. I wear a Patty Tack sweater, <laughs> jersey. Oh yeah, oh hey. Yeah. So does he know that? Yeah. Well, here let me let me just interrupt that for a quick for a quick second. We have to deal with what's most important. So um, we play a fair bit of hockey up here because there's nothing else to do, and there's no, if even if there was, we'd still do it. So we I uh, I sup I run a couple of the organizations of pickup hockey. So we have purple and white jerseys. Purple Heart, that's our logo, on the back. And every jersey has one of the vets who's come to our class. This was Annika, my daughter, who's out in Calgary. This was her idea. So this was Sergeant Wilhelm. We call him Kawasaki uh, Brian. And uh, Moose has two. So all the guys that are regulars get a white and a purple jersey. So Moose has two. And Patty Tax is one. You're a little slower when you wear that one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Jake Tarola is the other one. So you guys are not forgotten ever. You oh, might, the drawer. You might need to explain why Angie doesn't have her bed desk yet, other than it's not quite finished. But because of COVID. Oh, oh, co oh yeah, right. Well, yeah. That's why, yeah. That, yeah it we is have, done. He just can't deliver Well, it. actually, it is. It just, we haven't been able to go. And I didn't want to just send it out. I wanted to deliver it. So if you're going to build drawers and you have the opportunity to build a regular case, and when I say build a regular case, hey, you, where are you going? The, I, when I say a regular case, I mean it's a, it's a, it's a hollow, it's a hole. It's got um, the top, pardon me, the bottom and the top are parallel front to back. The sides are parallel front to back. And they're smooth. They're not, there's, there's no recess here. That way you can go in and you can build a box that fits that hole with a level of precision that actually allows it to close on a cushion of air. And that, that's going to last probably the longest. I think side hung are maybe a little bit easier. What? Just water deliverer. Oh, this. Tell everyone what your name is, mister. What's your name? What is it? <laughs> Herman Herman? <laughs> Speaking of Herman. So I, um, I, had a, I got a, a text last Saturday from John DeMio. And uh, you really need to go back and watch this episode. It was, Ken, would you find it for me, please, the date? It was uh, mid-October. And the topic was wood hinge boxes. If you can, or if somebody can find it and put a link in, uh, it was this was this was the, without a doubt the best episode, live episode we have ever done, I think. And John had originally contacted Luther or me, Luther. what Luther? Yeah. And he had said, Rob, um, my dad and I watch your show. And uh, my dad is 90. He contacted you. Pardon? He contacted you. He contacted me, and then I told Luther about it. Yes, I think that's how it worked. So John had contacted me and said, Rob, my dad and I watch your show um, whenever it's on. And uh, my dad is 95, 96, I can't remember. 
and uh, his health is failing. He's not expected to live much longer. But if you would give him a shout out, we think it would really lift his spirits. He said, my dad was a World War II vet, D-Day plus four, Utah Beach, fought across the hedgerows of northern France, was captured and uh, spent the last year of the war as a POW. And I remember thinking, I said, my goodness, a World War II vet, we can do a lot better than a shout out. So Luther went to work on it and Luther pulled out all the stops. There was no stone left unturned. <laughs> I, I know a little bit about military now from having been around them. If there's a job to be done, the job will get done regardless of what gets in the way. So Luther went to work, and everybody was, I mean, this doesn't sound like a compliment at first, but everyone was astounded after they watched the documentary that Luther put together and said, that was Luther? It was remarkable. But he had such good material. Here was a uh, living World War II vet who uh, fought with his four brothers, four DeMeo brothers, all of whom survived the war, in fact, he actually met up with his, one of his brothers, and they were fighting in these hedgerows. Bullet whizzed by Herman's head, hit his brother in the arm. His brother got medevaced out, and it was shortly after that that they were taken captive. So that kept his brother in the game while Herman was having to sit out as a POW. So uh, you'll see in the, uh, in the episode when you watch it, and trust me, October 17th. October 17th, and somebody will put a link in there. Look it up. So Luther found out that Herman had qualified for the Bronze Star, but because of an army snafu, he never got it, didn't even know he was awarded it. And uh, what a guy. So he went to work on it, and we had this all planned that uh, nobody knew anything about it. I don't think Herman knew anything about this. and I know he didn't because John and his family was going, was going to arrange to have it so that Herman would be watching and then all of this would just unfold. Uh, Luther was able to pull whatever strings he needed, got the, got the award, got it shipped to Herman's family. It arrived on the Friday before the Saturday we broadcast. And um, at the, uh, we, we did the presentation and then we actually, and Luther did this whole ceremony thing, which was awesome. And we presented Herman with his medal. And it was, there weren't too many dry eyes in the, in the country watching. Anyway, that said, um, I won't be sad if I get to live to be 96. So Herman uh, passed away last Saturday. And, I'm, uh, and I know that he was sick and he wasn't enjoying life, so he wasn't sad, and I don't think his family was. And I'm not. I'm just appreciative. Of, uh, of his sacrifice. So we, uh, we uh, collectively send our sympathy to the uh, DeMio family. And they have asked that if anybody wanted to, uh, um, what's the term, when, instead of flowers or anything else, they said if you want to make a donation in Herman's name, to benefit the PHP, and uh, we've had numerous ones come in this week. It was in the obituary. I read it. Hopefully, we can put it on there and add a link to that so that you'll be able to see it. So, thank you, John, for bringing Herman to our, uh, into our life. That was incredible. As short as it was, it left a lasting impression. And I must remember uh, uh, Bob 
because it was shortly after that that we found out about Bob, who was a 99-year-old Bob Harris, right, down in Florida. And Bob was a tail gunner in a Liberator, and I believe on his 40... I'm going to rehearse all these. And his 40th mission was shot down over Italy, spent two or three months as a POW. And Bob is still uh, actively woodworking, and hopefully he's on there tonight. Bob, our thanks to you. Uh, Those tears are for you as well. Anyway, um, shall we proceed? Sure. Question? Uh, Yeah, I have one from uh, Clark42. He says, I have bowed and twisted two by four. Which aspect should I start to correct this? The twist or the bow? Should I start with the conclave side of the bow? What's he trying to do? Do you know? For a laminated (laughs) tabletop. Out of two by four that are bowed and twisted? Oh, boy. Well, my... uh, my thinking is if you've got a piece of lumber that in its dry state has gone from being flat and true to being bowed and twisted, you've got a piece of wood that no matter what you do is going to continue to bow and twist. What that bow and twist is telling you is that there is internal stress within that piece of wood. So anything you do is going to upset that stress. So in that bowed and twisted configuration, it's now somewhat stable, but it really isn't. It's just there's enough pressure pulling it this way, but there's enough wood pulling it this way, and there's enough wood pulling it that way that it's found this equilibrium. So you go in and remove material, you're going to upset the apple cart, and it's going to continue. So what would I do? I would go back to the hardware store. I would go to the bank first, then go back to the hardware and get yourself another 2 by 4 Crazy, the prices. We're going to start building our houses with pink ivory, a little cheaper. So I, uh, I just think you're, I think you're asking for trouble, and no matter what you do, you're probably going to get frustrated with it. The best thing to do with something like that is to cut it and use it in short pieces somewhere else where it won't matter quite so much. But to try to take out a lot of, out of a lot of, to straighten a lot of a piece. Badly twisted like that, it's just going to continue to be misbehave. So don't save yourself the grief. Find another piece of wood. Yep. Do we have any announcements to make? You said what we're giving away, right? Oh, no, I didn't. So uh, tonight, yes, I did. I'll, I'll do it again. Tonight, we're giving away uh, three Purple Heart Dead Cat Sweaters. Your, your size, we're giving away, based on, the, uh, on our donations, we're giving away three of uh, Harold's shooting boards, possibly four. The mini, which you use with the block plane, the 18-inch and the 24-inch, and the, uh, if, we, if we have enough donations, we're going to give away the new mitered shooting boards. We're also giving away my traveling medium tenon with the purple heart handle. We'll sign the box for you. All you have to do is just register. You don't have to make a donation. If you would like to donate, uh, I, should, I should tell you where we are with that too. So um, in case you've been under a rock, COVID has thrown everything in the world for a loop. We have not been able to hold a class since fall of 2019. Uh, sorry. Oh, no. No, over there. All of our classes from 2020 were put forward to 2021. We've already canceled, had to cancel our May class. No, our April class and our May class. I'm looking for confirmation from somebody. Yes. Okay. So we're, we're having to cancel the classes if the borders still aren't open two months out from the class. Because we have to have time to get airline tickets and make arrangements. So April's been canceled. May's been canceled. Of course, uh, June and July are probably in jeopardy, although we don't know yet. The borders are still closed. On uh, New Brunswick, where we live, is doing fine, but Canada as a whole, Ontario's got record uh, infections, infections, and it seems to be completely out of control. They just put them into uh, six weeks of stay-at-home lockdown. Anyway... There is the potential on May 3rd 
that the governments of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland, in case you're not up on Canadian geography, those are the four most easternly provinces. And those four governments are going to allow travel in between those four provinces without any restrictions. Currently, if you go to one province or another and then come back, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Well, that would put a damper on our classes. If this opens on May 3rd, we are planning, and we're full steam ahead, we are going to do our first PHB class in almost two years. It's slated for May 24th to the 29th. It'll be in our brand new facility that we're scrambling to get ready. It will be available only to resident, pardon me, you don't have to be a resident, as long as you're living in one of those four Atlantic provinces. If you are a combat wounded vet that resides in one of those four provinces, we would encourage you to apply. We have not yet made the selection and we have had some incredible applicants. Uh, applicants who would, uh, would be selected no matter who they were competing against. Unfortunately, to be a fantastic applicant for our program means you're in a bad way. Uh, so we're only excited because we get to at least meet them and help them, possibly. We also have room for seven civilians who make up a huge and very important part of the class. And I think we have taken deposits on two or three. Two classes, the third, one, third one's potential. I, I spoke to him. In fact, the third one's definite. I spoke to him just the other day, another one of my doctor friends, Mike Morris. Um, so that's what we've got planned. We've had enough... Does, does, uh, has Dave given us a local count on how many we've had ap apply? It's over 20, right? Like closer to 25? There's a good chance. If we can do this, we will do another one. So um, that's where we are with it. We will resume the classes the minute they allow us to bring people into the country. So if you would like to participate and you would want to be part of this, the easiest way for you to do it is to donate. We use that money for anything related to the Purple Heart program, which is essentially bringing the vets in, sending them home with a boatload of tools. And thanks to uh, Jack Lane heading the, uh, the bench brigade and Chris Chahowski for uh, his work in helping arrange so that all of these benches can be provided. And these vets that are coming will each have a bench to take home with them. They don't, they don't even know that but the bench that they end up working on would be the bench they take home. And five of the seven benches, I believe, are being donated by um, civilians in the U.S. They're going to ship them to Callis, Maine. Chris is, uh, uh, Jack's in touch with them all the time, and I know they're right on schedule. And then we, uh, we because of a commercial entry, we can go down there and pick them up. We'll be bringing them here. And there's a couple Canadians that are making benches as well. So all seven vets will have... Uh, Benches to take home. Lloyd was making some. Lloyd. Yes. Yes. Lloyd. Kachuk. 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 Uh, Lloyd was a very good friend, very uh, a good customer. Known him for a long time. And Lloyd passed away just about a month ago. So uh, our uh, deepest sympathy goes out to his wife and family. Um, he'd been sick for a while, but Lloyd was a real... Um, he was making two of the benches. Wow. I wasn't, I wasn't up on that as much as I should have been, but that's typical of what Lloyd was like. So we've had some loss in the last little bit, but like I said, life marches on. And hopefully uh, his loss will be to the benefit of those soldiers that come and have a class or have a bench made by Lloyd. We need to get a hold of his wife, so if it need, need to be finished, we can get them here and get them work on them. Well, we have time. Jacqueline's daughter put a note on saying that she's watching it live with him when he was with us. So Jackie's on. What's her name? Uh, oh, it starts with a J. I can't remember. Jack Jackie Lane? <laughs> 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 I, wanna, I Jack. can't remember, but I saw it. It was way up top. Yeah, it was at the very yeah. beginning. Well, Jack and daughter Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's daughter. That's her name. Jack's daughter. <laughs> Glad to have you. Jack, you know how much we appreciate you, and uh, there's an awful lot of vets that are happy. I think we've delivered, I know we've delivered over 40. Jack, if you can speak up and tell us exactly how many benches have been delivered under our program, I'd love to be able to acknowledge that effort. Okay, next question, Frick. 
Oh, if you don't get a, if you don't get a, if you're not lucky enough to get one of these drawn, I, uh, Moose has been uh, helping us for a long time with this, and he has these in his shop. You can go to patsecretgarden.com, and you can order one if there's any left. But uh, I, we get, uh, we get, um, we get feedback from all over the world. We had a customer in Bulgaria. Romania. Romania that won one. Jessica and, uh, is her name. Jessica. 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 I was going to say Jessica, but. And uh, what, what was, it was cold over there and she was so warm and somebody made a comment. That's not, no, where, what's the story we said about somebody, if, get Moose to tell the story about somebody recently wearing their sweater and somebody recognizing it. Same oh, um, and yeah, no, this, 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 was a, this was a different one. Um, yeah, I got an e email from one of, uh, one of my customers who had, um, um, I, think, I think it was his wife, his wife was wearing hers when they went for their COVID shots. And one of the health professionals that was... Uh, uh, working at the center where they they get their vaccination, actually recognize the the sweater. sweater that he or someone else that he knew had. So it's a big country in the states, and uh, they, they we had two uh, purple hearts. <laughs> How is it two dead cats could meet? <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's uh, supernatural. Small world, yeah. Awesome. So go there and get your sweater. You'll love it. Tell everyone it is the warmest garment and the lightest you will ever wear. Harold's are, Harold's the, most, the newest, proudest owner. Next question, Fred. All right, this one comes from Brian Hall. Hi, Brian. He says, hey, Rob, question about hand planing. Is it reasonable to try and hand plane a chessboard to finish? Or is the repeatedly changing grain orientation going to cause tear out even with well set up planes? Uh, do you know I've never made a chessboard? But, and uh, if you think about it, Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know whether the chessboard whether they have end grain or long grain. I think it's typically long grain. They're alternating between maple and walnut or something. If he knew how to play, if you he if you it. laid it out so the grain is all running in the same direction, but I would think that you could do it. The key to any planing success is number one, a blade that is sharp, properly sharpened. Make sure you get a sixteen thousand grit shaft, and that will put an edge like nothing else. And it will allow you to plane things you would not have thought possible. And there would be multiple testimonials that will flood on there. By the way, if you've got a 16,000 and you've experienced what I just said, make a note on there to convince this chap. Get that sharpening kit that we have on our site. I put it together specifically for people to be able to get the kind of success that I'm fortunate enough to get. If you had the blade sharp, number one. Number two, minimal projection. That means the less projection, the less... The thinner shaving you're taking, people often watch, why do you take such a thin shaving? Well, the thinner shaving exerts less pressure on the wood fiber. And the less pressure is going to re result in less tear out. I can demonstrate by taking a piece of wood, having a blade out far, and planing and watching it tear, retracting the blade, and then playing the same piece, same direction, same blade, and five or six passes later, it's back to being perfectly smooth. So number one, sharp. Number two is projection, minimal. Number three, close that throat down. When I say close the throat down, it's funny. Ken, Ken and I were just, Ken was unfamiliar with this the other day. And he said, well, I've got the throat closed. And I looked at it and said, no, Ken, that's, that's, not even, that's not even close to being closed. Closed is when you can get that shaving through and nothing else. So if you're, if you're pulling a, a one thou shaving, then your gap should be one thou, maybe a thou and a quarter. What that does is it permits the leading edge, or I should say the trailing edge. If I have a, a, a Sharpie in here, I do good. When you set up your, your plane, if this edge right here at the end of the arrow, that's the forward part of the throat. Throat is where the shaving comes out. If you move that blade forward, now you might be asking, well, how, Rob, how do I move the blade, Rob? Well, you have to have a plane that has 
I shouldn't say you have to have. It's a lot easier if you have a bedrock style plane. That means that you can move this entire apparatus without disturbing the blade. So if you look, if you look past my adjust star, shameless commercial, there's three screws. There's one on either side. Those are called frog retaining screws. There's one in the middle. So what you're going to do is you're going to loosen about a quarter of a turn each of the two frog retaining screws. And you'll notice also that the adjuster allows you to get your screwdriver in there instead of having to work around a big adjustment knob. Now with that slightly loose, you can come in, get a hold of that screw, and as you turn it, it's going to move the whole apparatus forward. And what that will do is that'll close that gap down. Always best if you have a piece of white paper behind there or light so that you can see and you just gauge it until you get it where you want it. Be aware that this frog, this thing right here, sits on the sole of the plane, but it's also on a ramp like that. So as you move it forward, it's going to project. So you may have to come back, retract your blade a little bit in order to compensate for that. And that'll open your throat up a little bit because you've pulled the blade back in. Then you would go back and make another little adjustment until you get it exactly where you want it at which time you tighten the two frog retaining screws. Only takes about a quarter of a turn. And now you're in business. Now that's your best bet, with one exception, of getting a perfect surface, no tear out. Remember, the blade has to be sharp. A, a fourth alternative is to use something called a back bevel or a York pitch. And what we do is simply take our plane blade and instead of it just being flat on the back, Jake, do I have one here? Huh? I usually keep one in my tray. Here it is right here. So this says HA, HA stands for high angle. So let's open this up and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, I'm gonna pull the chip breaker back a little bit so you can see better. So normally, this sits in your plane. The bevel is on the bottom side on a standard bench plane. So that sits in there sitting on a frog held at 45 degrees to the wood. So you're planing the wood at 45 degrees. What we've done is we've come in and we have created, I'm going to try to hold this steady so Jake can hone in on that. Tell me when. Can you see it? Okay, so we've created a back bevel. I'm just going to get my steel rule and see if I can measure that for you because I know somebody's going to want to know. So we have created that, and, and this isn't that important, but that back bevel is pretty close to being a sixteenth of an inch wide. Now I have a video, a uh, YouTube that I did on creating this. So hopefully somebody will put the link in there for you. Now what happens, and uh, just so that there's no questions, I put my chip breaker back, and I put it right at the base of that back bevel. Now, we're back in, in the plane. We're sitting at 45 degrees. If we're calculating what we would call the angle of attack, we now take the 45 degrees, but we add to it the 20 degree back bevel because that has pitched the back of the blade instead of like that, it's pitched it up like this. And the way that interacts with the shaving increases the pitch to 65 degrees, makes it a lot harder to push. But in a lot of circumstances, it will give you a perfect finish, whereas a normal planing angle, you couldn't do it. So that's the, uh, that's the bits of advice I have there. I want to just say two things real quick. There's a, there's a real run on planes right now. All, some of the bigger companies are out. I heard one the other day. Some, they're quoting uh, February or March of next year before you can get a plane. So this five and a half is my personal favorite. Love it. I think everybody, it's the best plane out there. However, the number six is almost the same plane. If you put the two of them together, we'll start right with the front. Same knob, same rear tote, same blade, same chip breaker, 
Same lever cap, same frog. Here's the difference. By the way, the planes are the same width as are the blades. This one is two and a half inches longer. Does that make a big difference? No. If I had my uh, first choice would be this, but this would be a very close second choice. Where does this actually excel? Well, on the shooting board, you got a little more mass, which is advantageous. And we give the soldiers, when they come, they take home a number six. So I, uh, I wouldn't give it to them if I didn't think it was good. The nice thing about the number six, it's because it's a little bit longer, it'll do a little better job on flattening large panels or straightening long edges. Now, the last thing I want to tell you, it's a shameless commercial, but if you've read the emails that I've read coming from older folks who have not been able to use their plane because of arthritis in their hand, if you've tried to adjust, this is called the adjuster knob on a plane, and you have to turn it in order for the blade to go out for a thicker shaving or retract it in order for the blade to come in for a thinner shaving. The problem is there's lots of points of contact between this and the actual blade. The blade is under tension. This thing's called the lever cap, and that holds everything parked so it doesn't move, which also adds a lot of friction, so then turning this, it can be really difficult. Uh, biggest pain in the butt there probably is when it comes to hand planes. In fact, if I were to poll 10 people and say, what's the biggest drawback to a hand plane? Nine of the answers would be the adjuster knob. So I don't know whether it was Jake or I or the two of us together, but we got working on this a year ago, and we got thinking, we've got to solve this problem. And I think it's because we saw this on, a, uh, on the, on the uh, chamfer plane. It wasn't, it wasn't in that application, but they had this as a means of tightening and holding the plane together. And I said, shoot, why don't we make something like that I for see. the adjust? You said that? Jake said that. Why don't we make something like that instead of this in order to make it so we have a lot more leverage? It took a lot of prototypes back and forth before we finally got it just right. But thanks to uh, Paul, our uh, genius up in Ontario that uh, we work with and have been for years, Paul manufactures these for us, does a wonderful job. We have them for both Wood River and Lee Nelson. If you've had a problem with this, and as long as it's not a number four, but it's a four and a half or bigger, this will refit on your plane and make it so that you can make that adjustment with very little effort. It's a huge improvement. And for so many of these folks, it's allowed them to start using their plane again. So. I couldn't skip by that without mentioning it. You, you can get them on our site. Yes. And I, I uh, well, actually, let me give it, take one more question. Then I'm going to talk about T-shirts and uh, tell, you, tell everybody what Angie's role is. Okay. Luther, why don't you get through some questions some more? Just keep. Of course he does. <laughs> Thanks, Luther. Um, okay, this one comes from David. Hi, David. In Cambria, California. He says, Rob seems to remove the shaving after each pass of the plane. Is there a practical reason for this, or is it just a teaching habit? No, nope, no. Nope. I don't like lifting the plane up on the return stroke. I think, why? If you, don't, if you leave the shaving in the throat, there's a good chance when you're dragging the plane back, it gets sucked underneath the plane. Then you've got to turn the plane over and scrape it off so it's easier to just throw it out at the end and then just keep on going. And, of course, it just becomes a, 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 a habit. And everyone asks the question, but that's the answer. Next uh, Rick from Warminster, Pennsylvania, he says, does, hey, does Rob ever use cabinet slash card scrapers to finish odd-shaped sections, and how does he sharpen and burnish them? Yeah, we just did a video, didn't we? Didn't we just do a YouTube on sharpening? Oh, yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just did. Uh, hopefully, Luther can give you a link on that, and it'll show you exactly how I do it. It's, uh, yes, I do, but I don't do a whole lot. Harold does, because... Did I introduce you to that? Using yeah, we used to you used to have to sand uh, finishes between coats, and it's a pain. It would produce all this white dust, and if the wood was porous, it would get down in the pores. And I just started using a scraper to just quickly knock off the high spots. So Harold does all of our shooting boards. There's a ton. He goes through more finish. He goes through about a finish in a month that used to last me for four years. So he's doing a lot of it, and it's so fast and so efficient to scrape between coats, so if you're looking for another reason. So, yes, I use scrapers. I don't use a ton of them. I prefer the hand plane, but uh, I teach you how to do that on there. And, yes, I even do them for odd shapes. 
Every once in a while, I get into a situation where uh, I'm dealing with something that's not round. So I've gone in and I've modified, I've modified my scrapers to fit a profile. Real easy to do. I got another one in here where I was making um, spindles on a settee. And in order to get them shaped, or just to get rid of some of the facets that resulted from the uh, spoke shave, I, well, I don't have it here, but I took my scraper and I ground a, a half round, a half round notch in it and just polished it a little bit and I used that and it just did a great job. Good question. Next. Abby's oh, here. Oh, 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 oh. So, oh. introducing part of our team. Where is Angie gone? Here she is. This is Angie. This is Ken's, Ken's cousin. Angie and her, her sister Lynn live not too far from us, and they package all of our T-shirts. So if you were interested in, uh, in uh, sporting our colors, you can get a T-shirt. When it comes, it'll be neatly packaged, and there'll be a little seal on there with the symbol with the A on, which is Angie's um, A for Angie, A for perfect A, well done, beautiful package. Thank you. Next, Frick. Ebby is on. Ebby, Ebby, brother. I keep I keep an eye on you on uh, Facebook. All right. Question comes from Bob Stevens in Denver, Colorado. Hi, he, Bob. He just wants to know if you own a track saw. No, I do not. Um, do you? Do you own a track saw? Kind of a newer invention. I don't know how many years it's been out, but uh, they weren't they weren't around when I started. Um, why don't I? Well, we got a big shop. We got big saws. We got lots of help people to help. But if you were by yourself, track saw is great for breaking down material, particularly if you're going to build one of our benches where you're having to handle one inch MDF to be able to lay that on the floor and put that track saw on. I don't use it, but I I would encourage it. In fact, might even be something we might want to look into because we're going to start building benches, and when it comes to knocking up or uh, knocking apart big sheets of Big sheet goods, yeah, good idea. Uh, speaking of your MDF bench, Don in Bradford, Pennsylvania wants to hey, know Don. if you put a finish on it. Yes, we do. First ones, first ones we did, we put an oil finish. We used the tongue oil. We cut it with about uh, 15, 20% mineral spirits just so it would uh, soak in a little bit more or better. Um, the only problem with putting oil on that MDF is the edge of the MDF soaks Forever and a day. I'm just asking, going to ask Harold. Did you have you made any shooting boards yet with that new MDF? The stuff we just got the yeah. uh, the cabinet door stuff. Yeah. And did it did it? Yeah. But did it? What, did you notice any difference in how it absorbed on the edge? Oh, well, you got to put the okay. The yeah, that's the the downside. Dam. Oh, I was going to say the downside. One of the characteristics of MDF is the edge is going to absorb finish no matter what you're using. So the oil was just taking way too long, and the oil just doesn't give you the same level of uh, fin uh, protection that I was looking for. I oil it mostly just so that if glue drops on there, it'll wipe off. So we now spray them. But uh, in doing it, you've got to go in, and I, the last ones I did, I went and I purposely just sprayed the edges probably three or four times before I even started spraying the top and bottom. Top and bottom would get three coats. Edges might end up getting seven coats. But yes, I definitely want to put a finish on them. MDF is a great material. It has zero resistance to water, so you've got to be super careful about that. And uh, its corners are not very strong, so we always break the corners with a radius. Uh, other than that, keep a finish on it, throw a finish on it again every once in a while after it starts to get uh, marked up, and it'll last you a long time. I will also throw in, where am I? I'm talking up here now? that if you end up with scratches or marks, we just go in. In fact, every time we teach a class, there'll be guys that have cut into it when practicing dovetails. Go in with cyanacrylate, that is super glue, and just let it seep into the cut area. And then once it's dry, just flush it off. And it, the cyanacrylate stiffens up that soft inner core. And it's a great, uh, great for healing wounds on your MDF bench. Rick? Uh, Brandon in Oklahoma wants to know what brand of mortise chisels you recommend. 
IBC. And they will be ready. We don't know, but we have seen a picture. We do know they're in the works, but can't tell you when we're going to have them. The only other ones I would get would be Lee Nelson and forget it. They're not available and aren't going to be for a while. So every other, I've searched high and low, every other one that I've seen that I like, you, when you, uh, that, that, that I would have used, you, measure, you put a square on them. Instead of them having parallel sides and, and square top and bottom to those parallel sides, they're always slanted off on an angle like that. makes it very difficult to be precise with them. Uh, so if you can wait, hold out. We'll get you IBC ones, and they'll be they'll be what you want. Um, I also want to uh, one other little sad bit of news. Super Dave, his mother's favorite child, passed away. Trapper. Trapper, a big, hundred and seventy five pound, Saint Bernard. Uh, just a couple of days ago, mm-hmm. and this has been. The, well, she doesn't have anybody else living around her, so this was her. And she's up in Alaska. She's in Alaska, soon to move to New York, but um, she's really feeling the loss of having lost Trapper, her dog. So, Artis, we are thinking of you. Frick, question. All right. <clears throat> this one, uh, where was it? Comes from Jonathan in Jonathan Cavern in Cornwall, England. Jonathan in Cornwall. Yep. He says, on your list of top 20 hand tools, there is no mention of a plow or rebate plane. What do you think of these planes, and would you go for it? Well, a plow or a rebate plane. Uh, I do everything with the, uh, with the Lee Nielsen skew block plane. I hate to even mention that because you can't buy them, them either. They've been uh, on back order for a long time. So this is the plane that I like to use because it's so versatile. We actually provide fences for them, if you have one. The fence gives you some, a, a better alignment. It, you get more surface contact with the board before the blade engages, and you have more surface contact after the blade disengages. Helps keep you in a nice straight line. The, the plane only comes with the metal portion. We add, we add the wood portion, but this is adjustable. You simply loosen that knob, and the fence can move, slide side to side. The blade is on a skew, so it's going to be, it's going to provide you with the best chance of getting a nice surface when planing across the grain. You can cut rabbits with it. You, I always set my blade so it's just out beyond the edge. So that would be my choice. I think that's more versatile than the typical plane or a plow or rabbit plane. But you know what? You can't have too many planes. Buy them up. Okay, Herb and Lindsay and on. Herb? Herb in uh, Herb Wolf in Lindsay, Ontario Herb wants, Wolf? wants to know. I, that, I know Herb. When you sharpen mortise chisels, do you put a secondary bevel and tertiary bevel? Yeah, I I, char- I sharpen the mortise chisel essentially the same way that I would sharpen a beveled edge chisel. I used to go in and actually polish the sides and the back, but you know what? You use that tool with such blunt force. Um, yeah, I don't think it's as necessary as I may once have thought, but you definitely want it to have the edge needs to be very sharp because when you're doing that final chop establishing the outside ends of the mortise you remember you're cutting down end grain and if your chisel's not sharp it'll slide off that end grain you want it to bite in there that's why you also want your back to be nice and flat so it becomes very predictable where that chisel is going to go so yes prepare them right up to 16,000 grit just like you would your beveled edge next okay uh, Eric Fisher in Washington. Hi, Eric. That name's very familiar. He says, sometimes you use Baltic birch plywood for a cabinet carcass, and other times you use MDF. Can you explain your decision-making process on which to use? Um, yeah, I, I maybe I'll try to make one up. So we just did this, and this is... Uh, this is just, just a second. Jake's going to come oh. over. This may seem a bit extravagant, but remember, we have an online workshop where we teach folks uh, how to build furniture, how to design and build furniture. So what that means is I actually get paid to do this stuff for myself. So why spare the material? And why, why, go, why scrimp when you can, you can go all out? So this is going to be our cabinet to hold our chop saw. Why did I go with MDF? 
Well, MDF is going to be flatter than Baltic birch. Uh, it's probably a little bit heavier, so there's no advantage, disadvantage, I don't think, there. Why did I, I thought about using Baltic birch on the inside, but the, one of the disadvantages of the Baltic birch, especially when you get down into the narrower thicknesses, it tends to be nowhere close to flat. They can kind of be all over the place. So you're going to have your chances of getting a nice flat sheet of half inch MDF is going to be far greater than getting a nice flat sheet of half inch Baltic birch. That said, Harold and I have been toying with the idea of the benches that we're going to supply. We may actually go with a one inch, a three inch thick Baltic birch top instead of an MDF top. We're just playing around with the idea. It, it might be a little more durable. I don't know. But I, I, um, Read me the question again, Frick. How do I decide between Baltic birch and MDF? Yeah, you or said why sometimes one versus use, the other. Yeah, sometimes use one or the other. What yeah. leads to your decision-making process? Well, so on the inside of this, you want it to be nice and smooth. The smoother this is, the, uh, the nicer the drawer is going to slide. So if in that case, MDF was going to be a lot smoother. I don't have to do anything to it. If it's Baltic birch, I'm probably going to have to go in there and sand it to make it that smooth. So that's a reason. If there's any, any question that there's going to be moisture around it, I would definitely go with the Baltic birch. As I said, MDF has zero resistance to moisture. So that would certainly be a deciding factor. MDF, if you're, if you, if you're needing something that's going to be an exact dimension, MDF is going to be three quarters all the way around. Whereas your Baltic birch, like any other plywood, may vary slightly from side to side. So if I'm cutting a dado, if I'm cutting a dado and I and it's going to be seen, meaning where it fits is going to be seen top and bottom, then I would use I would use MDF over plywood because this stuff can be thin and thick, thin and thick all the way around the edges. Whereas MDF is going to be the same throughout. My favorite plywood is MDF core plywood. That's where instead of using a veneer core, so this is what we call veneer core, meaning that the this is oak plywood. So the oak is that little thin strip that you see on the two outside faces. Inside they're using another source of wood which looks like aspen. So they've got 1 8 inch sheets of aspen that are glued together in cross grain configuration. That's your, M, that's your veneer core. MDF core, this would all be MDF with a sheet of veneer top and bottom. That one is the most dimensionally stable and uniform width. Every once in a while, you'll see that these cores get overlapped or there'll be voids. Look at that. That didn't come out because of anything I did. That's just a, 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 um, what they just, a void. And sometimes you'll get that right underneath the veneer, which is terrible. So that's another time that I think MDF is superior. Next, Frank. Uh, How are we doing? Time-wise. Almost time to wrap it up. No, what? Luther wants us to go longer tonight. Uh, yeah, don't forget. What? This. Why? That's because Luther is on his couch. Tis the season. The sap is a running. And our good friends... Near Moncton, that produce our dark maple syrup. Hopefully, they'll have another banner year and keep you guys well supplied. Incredible taste. Frick, question, right. please. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, Dave Godson in Lincoln, UK. He Hi, says, Dave. on your planer slash thicknesser, do you resharpen your blades or just replace them? If you resharpen, can you show how to do it? You're not, he, he's talking about a thickness planer. Th yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I could take this top off, can I, Jake? Is, is that flexible? Is that flexible enough? Yes, it is. Okay, come over here, Dave. So on this one, this is a general 20 inch. Can you see in there? You can't. Can you now? Look at look peek peek in the corner. I can't scoop over. Sorry. Peek in the corner. So on this plane, I have a bird segmented head. 
you see those little chiclets? Yeah. I would never want anything but that on a thickness planer again. Because when they dull, all you have to do is go in there and I come over here where you can see it a little bit easier. Actually, I don't have it. I have it right here. I have it on my jointer as well. So when they get dull or if they get necked, each one of these little carbide chiclets have four sharp edges. They're actually numbered. And they're indexed. So if I end up nicking a blade here, instead of having to replace the entire knives, I would take this one out. I'd right, loosen the screw, rotate it, tighten it up again. And then I would go over and I would take this one out and do the same thing. And you'd go all the way around. If I had to sharpen, the, replace all of them, you just loosen them all, rotate them. They're all indexed. You don't have to, you don't have to set the knives. What a pain that is. Now, straight knife. In fact, Jake just took ours out. So this is the big 12 inch that we got not that long ago. 16, 16 thank you. We don't use it that much, but the knives were in terrible shape. And uh, there's some gouges in there that are uh, 30 second inch deep. So I'm not going to bother. I've, I have jigged up things before to sharpen them myself, but that was when I was cheap. <laughs> so now I send them out and let somebody else do them. So yes, the answer to that question is straight knife, send it out, let somebody else sharpen them. But if possible, if we use that, if we use that big 16 inch at all, I would spend the money to get a segmented head. They will custom make it, but it's about $100 US per inch. So a 16 inch joiner would be $1,600, which one time of, set, well, actually joiner knives are not that bad. Planer knives are absolute pain, but uh, it pays for itself if your time means anything. Did you know that one has little set screws that hold the on the bottom side yeah, to so bring them up? Yeah, raise? yeah, you can access them on the top. You just yeah. you partially snug it up, and then you can just use that to raise it up. The problem is, is the second that you raise it up too much, you have to go back now to you got to go and undo everything. And but it is better than the ones that don't have it. The worst ones are putting uh, setting the knives on that 14 inch general. There's no way of doing that. You just kind of have to put a block of wood in on both sides and rotate it by hand backwards, and hopefully it'll push the knife up in. You tighten the gibs just enough so they'll stay and put, but they'll move under pressure. Not a very exact science. I foresee another purchase in the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the bird, it's B-Y-R-D. They're the ones that invented it. It's called the Shelix, and it's on a helical pattern. And in fact, each one of those little, those little, uh, do we have any in the cupboard? Yeah. Right here? Each one of these little, oh yeah. So uh, my wife did this, it was Kim that did this? So we have two, uh, I, gotta, I, I can't do this without introducing these guys. Brothers from different mothers, pardon the dust. If you knew how old he is, you'd realize why he was dusty. So this is Luther, all smiles. This is Super Dave, forced him to smile, having to stand that close to Luther. Super Dave and, and Luther are... Told to hold his breath. <laughs> Suck it in, I thought we said that too. <laughs> These are the guys that uh, help us make uh, Purple Heart the success that it's becoming. And uh, both of them are, uh, are famous for their quotes. So my wife had a friend who made this... Um, do these quotes. I'm going to frame them. So Luther's, and by these are raised letters. So Luther's quote was, what's the plan? He's, he's army. He's artillery. They don't want it drop there. They want it drop right there. So everything has to be done in triplicate. And then again, and Super Dave's quote, which actually he has a better quote than this, tracking like a compass on an iron mine. But his best quote is, if you leave it to the last minute, it only takes a minute. I love that one. We should have that one done, too, because that's, that's the better quote. That's what you live by. That's, that's my Much motto. Much to Luther's dismay. Maybe I'll claim that one, Dave. Um, where do we go from that? You were going through your chiclets. Oh, oh yeah, the Shelix, right. <laughs> Thank you. Bring you guys here for a reason. Keep me on track. So in here... Right side, oh yeah, perfect. Oh yeah, this is, 
The, this is really, I, uh, I was asked one time what I thought was the most advantageous um, invention in woodworking tools in the last 50 years. And the saw stop would be, have to be number one. But number two is this. So here are the, sh here are the so there it is right there. Bird Tool Corporation. Actually, it doesn't give you any address at all. But that you can see how they spell the name. So you buy these. I can't remember how much they cost. I don't even care because they're so good. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a slight radius on these so that when they're in place, they don't leave little, if, you know, you'd end up with little tracks from the corners otherwise. But there's a slight uh, radius on each one of these cutter surfaces so that like a plane, feathering the edges of our plane, each one blends into the next and leaves a lovely surface. And then they give you that tool. You're supposed to put them on with a torque wrench too. You, the only thing you have to be careful of is these are carbide. So if in, if in putting that back in place, you've got a bit of dirt under there, or you don't have it sitting flat and you tighten it down, you'll snap these. So you need to be careful of that, but fantastic system. Absolutely fantastic. There's been, there's been lots of uh, other companies I think that have uh, copied them, but Bird is the original. And well worth the money. I, uh, oh, we got a whole bag of those in there. Jake, would you want crazy buying them again? There's a whole bag. Like, they come, they come with yeah, sure. <sighs> yeah, great system. Get it. Next question, Frick. Remember, sign up for our draw tonight. We're giving away three Purple Heart Dead Cat sweaters, we're giving away at least three of Harold's shooting boards. He paid for them. And our uh, grand prize will be my uh, Purple Heart Medium Tenant Saw. Where are we with donations tonight? We're over 1,000. But I haven't finished adding up the okay. recent ones. All that. Any more vets to say hello to? Really? I'm going to have to make some phone calls. Frick, next question. All right, next one comes from Brant Bolden. Hi, Brant. He's in Virginia Beach. Beach. He says, what is a good table leg joint that is strong and not ugly, but also allows the legs to be removed for transport? Oh, wow. Table leg joint. Are we, I assume we're talking kitchen table, not a coffee table. Well, you could do something like this, this uh, mortise and tenon, which has yeah, a... Keep in mind, this is an upcoming workshop. Well, are you, um, are this is a spoiler alert? Yeah. Oh, I get to say that. Here's a, here's a good one. Where this comes all the way through, there's a, see if I can knock this out so I can show it to you a little bit better. Um, mallet. It's actually amazing how, how uh, good of a joint this is. So this hole is tapered and the taper matches this taper. So after you put it together, and of course, there's a little, the, uh, the hole goes inside because you wouldn't want it to bottom out. And you put that in there, give it a whack, and that pulls that thing rock solid. And to take it apart, a couple whacks on that side. Of course, the key is you don't want your taper to be too... Can you, it, can you show that again really quickly? I was on the wrong camera, sorry. Come on, Frank. I can't multitask, apparently. Okay, yeah, you're you good. It? Yeah, you you're see good. see it? There's yeah. a taper. So your taper has to be somewhat shallow. If you make your taper too steep, then this wouldn't work. Kind of like a Morse taper. And then when you want to reassemble it, you just put that in, give it a whack, and it's snug as a bug. And that can either go through this way, or you can have it coming down through the top. And that would be, uh, that would probably be, uh, my first uh, first recommendation, because you can use different colored contrasting woods, so you can make a real feature out of it, kind of an arts and crafts type thing. Um, another another would be not as pretty, but you could just have a, mort a regular mortise and tenon, no glue, and then have a lag bolt coming in from the outside to pull it tight. I've done that before too when we used to on our bench that we used to take to the wood shows, but you know you're sitting there undoing bolts forever. We switched to this, and it was just a whack, whack, and, you know, take down, knock, uh, knock down, pack up was minutes instead of 30, 40 minutes. 
So either of those. Now, if you, you don't want an ugly bolt sitting on there, you mentioned, so you'd have to have, figure out some kind of a plug. You could also, yeah, there's lots of things you could do too. You could buy those, what are those bolts called? They're half machine, half wood. Anyway, you can buy bolts. You, yeah, that, yeah, that's where they use them. So one half of it is a, uh, is, a, is a wood screw and the other half is a machine screw. So if you put the, the wood screw into the end of your bottom of your mortise and you had a hole coming through your tenon into a round hole accessed from the inside. Over, can you take a quick little walk over here, Jake? Excuse me, Megan. So here's how we put these together. Am I still within uh, range, Frick? Yep. So if Jake can get up, you, you can't? You can't sit down up here? All right, so I'll just tell you. So here's, here's our stretcher. And on, on uh, some, what we used to do, what? How come? You can see this one, not that one. It is? What do you, uh, what, what do you, I don't know what you're pointing at. Oh, 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 here. Okay, so what you would do is you would have mortise and tenon, no glue, and if, it was, if this piece was thick enough that you could actually put that bolt, screw that bolt in, not seeing it from this side, and then that, you'd have a hole coming through the tenon with a circle cut out here that you could access and put a nut on. Now what we do is we have these on the inside so you don't see it. So that would be another method of having a mortise and tenon and being able to break it down and move it. But I'd say go with the, with the, the, uh, the wedge. Little, not, not really hard to do, but a lot more uh, interesting to look at. Next, Frick. Okay, next one comes from... Oops, come on, uh, next one comes from Wes Brown in Kentucky. Hi, Wes. He says, what is your favorite wood to work based on how, it's, how it makes the shop smell? The first time I ever worked mahogany, it was instantly my favorite. Oh, really? Um, well, our favorite around here is yellow cedar coming from British Columbia. We don't work with it because it's too expensive. It's $100 or something a board foot. But it is the most fragrant wood. The smell is just, oh, it's therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, I would say Vera Wood's far more fragrant. I was going to say, Jake carries around a piece of Vera Wood for a while just smelling. Well, it. that's only because it smells like Dave. And it reminds me of Super Dave. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we don't want to go there. Getting too intimate. Not that yet. there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> I should tell a story about the time Dave and Jake stayed the night at Danny Bell's. You've told it many times. Oh, have we? Okay, well, we'll yeah. skip that then. <laughs> we don't want to embarrass Felix. Um, some more woods that are really fragrant. Well, we have, uh, we have um, torrified maple that Jake likes because he thinks it smells like maple syrup. And I think it smells like a house fire. Uh, I love walnut. I, 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 can t I can smell walnut being used in the shop instantly. Uh, poplar stinks. Um, most of the cedars bother me to the point where it almost uh, chokes you so you can't breathe. And pine the same way. I have to wear a mask when I work with pine or I'll end up, I'll end up uh, with respiratory ailments the rest of the day. So, so, yeah, well, we don't get to spend much time with it because it's too expensive. Some of the most fragrant woods, vera wood, tulip wood, king wood, um, coca bolo. You get into some of these exotics, they smell fantastic, but you'll develop an allergic reaction to them real quickly. They all have very, very unique and incredible smells. But as far as the general wood that we work, probably walnut would be the one that would be the most, the most, I wouldn't say fragrant, but the most uh, specific smell. I always used to tell people I felt rich when I worked with walnut because of the smell. But next, Frick. All right, next one comes uh, from Daryl Burleson in Kansas. He says, "Will Hi, a, will a thicker <laughs> will a thicker replacement blade make my old style plane function as well as a newer one, providing the rest of the plane is restored?" Well, just just yeah, water, please. Um, so if you look at an old Stanley plane, have I got uh, 
Have I got any, got any right here within reach? Yeah. Where? Right Have we got a Stanley plane with an original blade? Right there on that card at the end of the joint. There's a small joint there. Oh, yeah, down underneath. Can you see them? So the problem with the uh, Stanley planes, which what everybody would refer to as a... Uh, is there anyone with a blade on it? This one does. Shoot, that's a part out of this. Well, Jake's actually got the thing all apart. Here. Here's a, uh, here's a four and a half, which, good vintage. Um, um, Brazilian rosewood handle and knob. But look how thin the blade was. And if we measure that, that'll come in somewhere between 70 and 80 thousandths of an inch. Now, that's not a very thick blade. And uh, even tuned up with a blade that thin, it... it no, no, he said with a new... Yeah, I know, but I, I'm going to tell the whole story. Okay, that measures 70, 72 thousandths of an inch in thickness. That is a thin blade. I don't know why they did that, but it, it has a high-pitched vibration when you use it. Thank you. If you put a replacement blade like this, that measures 140 thou. That's double. There's the comparison. So putting a big thick blade like that on a Stanley plane is the, is the single, will make the single biggest difference because it does not vibrate. Now, if you go in and fix all of the contact points to make them solid, because there was a lot of error in these planes, you know, surfaces didn't meet the way they should. Faces of the frog were rarely flat, which means part of the blade would be sitting in midair. But yes, you'll notice a huge difference just increasing the thickness of the blade. Having said that, you're better off buying a, buying a Wood River plane. The amount of work that you put into this, and you still don't have something that was made with very exacting tolerances, whereas these were designed... And yeah, and the casting. Cast iron versus ductile iron breaks. Break? Well, same thing. Uh, will crack or break if dropped? Doesn't crack or break. Fully stabilized? Not stabilized. It is now because it's so old. But you know, you're better off. A, your your first choice should be go buy a new plane. But if it's a if it's a M family heirloom that you want to bring back to life, by all means, put a thick blade on it, and it will perform far better than it did. Next brick. All right, next one me. comes from uh, Eric Sicard in North Carolina. He says, hey, I, Eric. I recently bought a couple new chisels. When I choke up on them for pairing, I get cut by the very sharp edges. What is the best way to round those over without impacting the chisel's use? Huh. Well, there's a brand out there that literally brings their sides, slopes their sides right to the bottom, right to the back, without any little landing. You're holding a knife edge. What's up with that? Here's what you have to have. You want bevels on the side of your chisel because that's what allows you to get in between the tails without bruising them. But you need to have a little landing, a little flat spot there so that you don't end up with a knife edge where that bevel meets the back. So the only thing you can do is go in and on a diamond stone, which is what I would do it on, Grind that back and forth. I would return them personally, but grind them back and forth until you create enough of a flat spot. That little flat spot is not going to interfere when you're getting in between the tails, but it will protect you. I, I hold my chisel like that. First time I uh, actually, first time I had someone show up with the chisels I think you're talking about, I was teaching in Edmonton, Alberta, and the class we were in was a long, narrow classroom, and the guy at the back, it took me a while to finally get back down there to see what he was doing. And I got there, and there was little spots of blood all over his bench and all over his work. I said, what are you doing? He said, these chisels. And his fingers were all sliced because it was literally a knife edge. So you're holding that, tapping your, ch your chisel, and it's slipping through your fingers with this razor. Well, it wasn't razor sharp, but it was sharp enough to cut. By the way, you can do that on a piece. I was cutting MDF the other day, and the edge of the MDF sliced my finger. So I guess I need to get tougher hands. Next, Frick. Okay, next one comes from 
uh, Robert Kubek in the Hi, Czech, Re- Czech Republic. He says, do you have some tips or tricks on how to fix uh, if, for some reason, the tenon shoulders don't fit? Uh, yeah. Um, the easiest way to do that... For, am I not allowed to answer questions if we're going to do a video on it? I'm just telling you to tell them that we're covering this in greater detail. Okay, we're covering this in greater detail in the near future. Actually, I remember reading the script. So I don't have one right at my ready. But the, the easiest way to do this would be to square off the end of your tenon. Okay, so you've got your tenon sticking out beyond your shoulder. Your shoulder is not square or... Your shoulder's not parallel to the end of your tenon. If you square off your tenon, take your marking gauge. Now, you probably should buy a Rob Cosman marking gauge. Here's why. They come with razor-sharp blades. Rex, back there, sharpens the blades before they go out. So they're nice and sharp. And you can go in, referencing off of the end. This is why I say you have to square up the end of your tenon because you're going to use that as a guide to now go all the way around carefully, all the way around, and reestablish that shoulder. If you try to do it with a shoulder plane, then you're, cha- you're, you're it's like a dog chasing its tail. You cut across this one, then you cut across the end, then you cut across this one, and then you hope when you come here, these two surfaces line up, and rarely do they do. Do it this way. Follow all the way around. And you can actually slice right down through that shoulder and make it perfect. Get good with a marking gauge. Perhaps one of the most versatile tools in the shop. And you don't want one, you want three. Right, Ken? At least. (laughs) Three, at least. Just to start with three. Why? I always have three or four of them on the go. I don't have to switch back and forth. So every time you have to switch back and forth, particularly on a multiple... Like I was building these drawers... So I had one gauge set for this depth from here to here. I had another gauge set from this depth from there to there. If you have two gauges running, you don't have to make any changes. So everything's going to be the same all the way through. And then you end up using a third one for something else. So great tool. Um, We sell them. We can sell them with, you can buy the blades on the cutter. And we we have different diameter blades for different jobs. If you need a little more reach, we have... Our largest diameter blade is 5 8 and the smallest is 3 8 Watch our video that we did on, on marking gauges because the new style, and I say new, new as in the last 25 years, the wheel style gauges are far more versatile than the old pin style. In fact, if you're still using an old pin style, you might want to try one of these wheel gauges. They are so much more versatile and I'd say even more accurate and easier to sharpen. All right, last question. It is? What time is it? 52. So let's do the draw. Maybe we could do a couple of quick questions. Mm. No. There's no we such thing quick with questions? you. Quick questions? No such thing with you. <laughs> uh, Dan Vasquez. We've all been here before. Yeah. Dan Vasquez in New I Jersey says, crew. how do you plane a miter joint? Hi, Dan. Or other cross-grain joinery like rail and style cabinet doors? So how do you plane? Once it's assembled. Once it's assembled, the surface yeah. Yeah. where you've got... Yeah. So, quick example. Uh, well, you're looking at this. You're talking about you've assembled. This is your this is your uh, style. This is your rail. So, when you put it together, rarely is this going to be perfectly flush. So, you're going to have to do it after the fact. So, what I like to do is either plane this piece and this piece down before you assemble. Or plane that piece and that piece down before you assemble. If you plane this, if you plane the rails before you put it together, but after you've already done the joinery, when you assemble it, it's going to leave the styles proud of the rails. And it's going to be a lot easier to come in and plane. That one's done too. You're going to plane the length of this down until you get it flush with this. And if you're really careful and your blade is sharp, minimal projection, you can do it. Now, if you plane this one and this one first, and you're then planing this one being thicker down to this, you're having to cross over this piece, and you run the risk of hitting that, and a cross-grain scratch will show up a 
a lot a lot faster than if you had a scratch running parallel to the grain. So that's your best bet. You just have to be really careful with it. And you can do it, but it is a challenge. Get, get really good with your plane, but that little tip of pre-planing them before you assemble will go a long way. Good question. Another short one? Uh, oh, I'm going through the draw names. We can wrap it up. Okay, Megan, how'd we do tonight? Um, $33,420. $33,000? $33,400. $3,400. So we're giving away three Purple Hearts. We're giving away... Uh, we'll be generous. We're going to give away three shooting boards, and we'll give away my, uh, my saw. We had some very generous donations. Listen, As folks, always. you know the reward for helping these guys. I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you for recognizing it. And uh, this tough hombres will find a permanent spot in my shop. This actually was sent to me by John DeMio, and that represented Herman's, Herman's, um, I never can remember the word. Re is it a regimental patch? Is it a divisional patch? I know it's bigger than a squad patch. But T-O stands for Texas and Oklahoma. So these guys gained recognition for being exceptional in World War I, hence the, hence the nickname Tough Hombres. But that's, where they, that's the two states that they came from. And I just had a chap call me the other day. In fact, he uh, I had a great conversation. His dad was D-Day, Utah Beach. He was Tough Hombres. And he was injured twice, got sent home, on the second injury, and I and he had all this the army information that uh, was sent to his mother, his mother and his grandmother uh, about his dad when he was in when he was fighting, and he sent it to me to read. Now I got to look it up on the computer because it's faded and hard to see, but I certainly appreciate it. And we had a nice chat, so uh, we saw we owe so much to all of those who serve in the military, but when you think back of that generation. This war was won by 19 and 20 year olds. Moose's dad was uh, was a midship gunner in a uh, Lancaster, am I correct? Mid upper, yeah. Mid upper, yeah. And I've been in a Lancaster. That's a that's a Coke can. It's there were no uh, there were no luxuries. Ken's father-in-law was uh, was fought in. Oh look, we got we got a roomful. Ken's father-in-law fought in uh, Battle of the Bulge. He was shot in the head and left for dead and was found the next day. The Germans had left him for dead, and he survived, was uh, frost, severely frostbitten, had problems with his feet his entire life, lived to be 80, what, Ken? Uh, 82, I think. 82. And, of course, they found all this out from a friend of his from Florida. He never talked about it. And Harold's dad fought in... France, Italy, and Africa. Yeah, and uh, Harold grew up with a father... That suffered from PTSD. They didn't know what it was, but uh, Harold knows all about the night sweats and the screen, the night terrors. And oh my! Jack, Jack, Jack Lane put a note on saying uh, they were sorry to hear about Lloyd's passing. He was excited to be part of the Bench Brigade. Chris Kiskowski and Josh Frost have stepped up to build two benches for the May Canadian Workshop. Can you hear that? Thank you, gentlemen. Did they did, hear that? Did, were you able yeah. to hear that? I, I could hear it. Okay. You can hear because you're in the room. Can they hear it? I, I, whatever I hear through here, oh, they can. Oh, can they hear? hear? Okay. Thank you, Jack. Did we find out how many how many benches have been awarded? 31. He said 31. 31. 31. I was thinking ahead. So 31 combat wounded vets that have been to our program have received a bench. And a huge thank you to those members of the bench brigade. Those guys do this out of the goodness of their heart. Thank you. All right, so, ready? Are we ready for a draw? We are. All right, let's begin with uh, Dead Cat number one, Purple Heart Special. All right, your chances of winning this evening are one in 678. That's how many people we have on tonight? That's how many people have entered the draw. How many, how many viewers do we have tonight? 800. 800 and something. Yeah, we have 800, yeah. <laughs> All right, ready? What's going first? Dead Cats? Dead Cats. Dead Cat number one. Dead Cat number one. <laughs> is Clint Bourgeois. Or Bur I'm going to... I'm going to say it with the, with the French accent. Uh, Louisiana. 
Ah, Clinton, Louisiana. Did, uh, Ray wasn't on the night. No, his name's Clint. He's not from Clinton. No, he's Clint, from, Lu- Clint from, from Louisiana. Yes. Congratulations, Clint. Let us know what size you wear. And right. say hello to Ray if you see him. Dead cat numero de Ubica Welch in United Kingdom. Ubica in the either, UK. Either her name or his name is Ubica Welsh or his name is Ubica from Welsh, UK. There's no commas. Okay. All right. Congratulations either way. Either way. Dead Cat 3. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jim Landers in Cody, Wyoming. Ah, Jim. Cody, yes. You'll need yours about 11 months of the year. I have friends in Cody. Are you going to four Dead Cats? Three. Okay, so what's next? The next is mini. Uh, mini mini shooting board. Mini shooting board is going to Bert Rodriguez in the United States. Doesn't say where exactly. Congratulations, but. Bert. Eighteen uh, inch shooting board. Eighteen inch shooting board is going to Terence Voth Voth Estevan in Saskatchewan. Hey, Terence. God save the Queen, brother. And the 24-inch shooting board is going to a guy named Peter. <laughs> he didn't put his last name, but Peter in the United States. How are we going to find him? Well, we have his email address. We don't post the email oh. address. So, yeah. <laughs> Peter in the U.S. Hopefully he's the only... We'll send it USPS. <laughs> <to Peter>. Yeah. <laughs> Peter is we'll just send it to Peter. Peter. Sure, some Peter will get it. So that's the, uh, that's the three shooting boards. And now for the Purple Heart... Um, Medium tenon that I'll sharpen before we send out. Grand prize oh, winner is. <laughs> it's already sharp. Winner is Curtis Zwingli in Alberta. Hey, Curtis in Alberta. Another yep. Canadian. Did you tell them about that time we, sold, we, <coughs> we drew for a miter shooting board to Bulgaria? Uh, yeah, what did we do? How, how did we take care of him? Offer him a gift certificate? The shipping was $500. <laughs> Just a little bit more than the prize. Is that it? We're back in two weeks. Don't know what our topic is. We'll come up with it. Oh, I, I meant to ask you tonight to send in your suggestions on what you like or if you like this format. A uh, special thank you to everybody that's here. Rex came in late. He's behind us. Um, appreciate Dave being is Dave on the, Was Dave on tonight? No, he's... Oh, he was at a friend's house. Yeah. Father-in-law's birthday. Father-in-law's birthday party. Happy birthday, father-in-law. Family's house. He doesn't have friends. Except yeah. for Jake. <laughs> <laughs> the digs. Special uh, thank you to Luther. Call you later. And who else was, el- was anybody else on helping us tonight? Angie and Lynn. Have a good night, folks. Summer's on its way. Actually, we had four inches of snow this morning, but that's beside the point. <laughs> See you in two weeks. Music for...